Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. And the first item on this afternoon's agenda will be the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Welcome everybody. The first item I'd like to announce is that this Friday is the filing deadline for the qualified health plans on the exchange for 2022. And that is May 7th, this Friday. We expect to see requests from MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I would ask folks to consult our website where we have a rate review page and it allows you to follow uh, the process as well as any documents related to this process. The second item I'd want to announce is that we have posted our schedule for May under our public meetings. It's a, a very robust schedule. Um, just a, a note that on May 19th, we have scheduled the primary care advisory group and that starts at 5 p.m. And the rest of the items are uh, scheduled at 1 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon. But take a look at that. It's a, it's a pretty interesting schedule we have for the next month and, and robust. And then last, but certainly not least, um, just to announce again, we have ongoing public comment on a potential next agreement, all payer model agreement with CMMI uh, that is posted on our website. So we encourage the public to provide public comment uh, so that we can share that with the, the other signatories on the agreement, that being the governor and the secretary of AHS. And we are sharing all of the public comments with our partners over at AHS and the Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS as they are leading the way in the potential next agreement negotiations. And that is all I have to report out today. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, April 21st. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Tom and seconded by Maureen to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 21st, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. So next on our agenda, we're going to uh, move to Russ McCracken, and Russ is going to talk about um, a couple of uh, draft rules and um, talk to us about uh, what he has learned since we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Russ. Great, hey, thank you, uh, Chair Mullen. I have a couple of slides that I'll pull up here as well. <clears throat> Um, so we're picking up where we left off two weeks ago uh, with discussion of the draft data submission and data release rules. There were two uh, open points, open questions that um, we took back and did a little bit more work on. And so we're reporting back uh, to the board on, on those two questions. Um, the first one is in the draft data release rule, and uh, it relates to um, uh, fees charged uh, for um, data access and restricted data sets. And the draft rule says that those restricted data sets and access um, to the secure enclave environment are made available at the rate charged by the board's vendor um, to authorized users who can then pay the board's vendor, uh, who would then pay the board's vendor directly. And the question was, how does that comport with the state's procurement um, requirements and, and specifically Bulletin 3.5? So we went back and took a look at that. And the way that um, it is structured currently in the OnPoint, um, OnPoint is our vendor currently, and the way that that contract is structured, which reflects the what's in the rule, is it's an IT contract with a zero dollar deliverable, and that that deliverable specifically is the restricted data set extracts or the access. And the contract specifically says that um, authorized users will pay on point directly uh, for 
for those data set extracts or for the access. And, and we're talking here really about non-state uh, users um, because they're the ones who are charged a fee uh, for accessing the data. And um, our view, our analysis after going through that again is that it, it is in compliance with Bulletin 3.5. The on-point contract went through the state procurement process as required in the, the Bulletin. Uh, it was approved by ADS's procurement advisory team. Um, and any subsequent or successor uh, vendor agreement would similarly have to go through the state's uh, required procurement process to make sure that that zero dollar deliverable, which is reflected in the rule, is is also done um, in compliance with the uh, with Bulletin 3.5 and the uh, procurement requirements. There was a related question to that, whether the fees are listed somewhere and the fees are included in the on-point contract, which is available on the board's website. Uh, the fee is $5,250 per extract, uh, subject to change over time, and a one-time setup fee of $550. <clears throat> Access to the secure uh, analytic environment is set up in a tiered structure based on the number of seats per month. Um, currently, only the state agencies and state entities have access to that environment. So um, it's not that's may at some point in the future become relevant for non state users, but it's not currently. Um, I can pause for questions on that or I can go on to the second follow up point that we had. Do board members have any questions? I just have one question on do we know how many people use the services and you know how, how many $5,250 on point received? Um, so uh, this is Kate O'Neill. Uh, I think can answer that question for you. Uh, we um, have almost uh, 25 or 30 um, users uh, using um, accessing the data through the um, secure analytic environment who are state agency users. And uh, they, the fee for uh, the, the monthly pricing that we pay for seats is paid for uh, through the, the contract. Um, the non-state entity users generally range um, in, in the low numbers, like two or three requests uh, per year. Uh, and um, the fee that is is paid by a non-state entity um, is is a one-time fee unless they need um, a refresh of the extract or if they're asking for something different during the period of time in which they are authorized to to use the data um, and and we allow author we authorize data. Um, through a data use agreement on um, a maximum of a two-year increment. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Let's proceed, Russ. Great, thank you. The second question um, was really in response to a comment uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and it relates to timing for implementation of any change to a data submission manual. Uh, the way that the prior draft that we reviewed last week works, um, any change to a data submission manual is done by um, making that proposed change known to the submitters, giving them at least 30 days of notice uh, to review and comment on the change. Then the Data Governance Council would review and has to approve any change. Uh, and then that's followed by a 90-day period um, that all submitters have to implement that change. And the draft of the rule said um, 
submitters could request an extension of that period of time for good cause, and they could appeal any decision of the Data Governance Council to the board. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield asked that we look at extending that period of time to 180 days uh, for compliance from the 90 days in the prior rule. And in addition to provide 90 days uh, for the submission of test files. And so we, we took that comment back and we understand um, certainly that there's going to be a range of changes. Some are certainly going to take longer than others to implement. And so we're, we're sensitive to that and think we would continue to be sensitive to that throughout the process. Um, we also looked at a couple of specific scenarios for how long it would actually take a change to be implemented, um, factoring in the 30 day notice period, um, the fact that the Data Governance Council meets every other week. So any change that spanned two meetings would add an additional 60 days to the process. Russ, I just wanted to correct you that the Data Governance Council meets every other month. Every other month, sorry. <laughs> would add 60 days to the process. Um, and so you know, with, with that in mind, we looked at our, our timing again. We also took a look at um, the way some other states approach it, uh, approach updates to their reporting manuals for their all payer claims databases. Um, some, some states like Maryland update, ma update their manual on a yearly set schedule. Um, other states don't have a, the same yearly set schedule, and they provide um, of the ones we looked at a range from 120 days to 180 days for compliance. So um, keeping all that in mind and with some further discussion for the team, we suggest extending the period of time for implementation uh, from 90 days to 120 days following the Data Governance Council uh, approval of any change to the reporting manuals. And in practice, that's in addition to the additional 30 days of review and comment period prior to a Data Governance Council meeting. Um, we're also suggesting that we revise Section 8403 to specifically have the Data Governance Council look at and consider uh, comments from the submitters with respect to how long a change to the reporting manual will take to comply. Um, and you know, that's really to recognize that some changes may be onerous and might take more than 120 days, might take more than 180 days. Um, but uh, our our feeling was not every change is going to take six months to implement, so we thought a 120 day compliance period was reasonable, with the additional understanding that the um, and there's a lot of words on the slide, but the, the Data Governance Council will review uh, comments related to the. Um, compliance time, we'll consider it and we'll extend that compliance time if uh, determines that that is that that's warranted. Um, <clears throat> so I will pause there to take any uh, any questions on the changes to the data submission manuals. Are there questions? Before I open it up to uh, public comment, Russ, um, would this require two separate motions or how do you uh, desire us to proceed? Mm -hmm. I suggested one motion um, with some proposed language here that the board approves the drafts of Rule 8 and Rule 9 uh, with the changes discussed. Uh, which were on the prior slide related to the reporting manual. 
and that uh, you instruct us to move forward with the formal rulemaking process to get uh, both rules into that process and, and get that started. Um, and, you know, I, I think we talked about it last week, but that process also includes additional public comment um, opportunities on the rule. Okay. So um, let's open it up for uh, public uh, comment at this point, and then I'll come back to the board for further discussion and a possible motion. So public comment. Good afternoon. This is Michael Durkin from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. I, I just wanted to thank the board for the opportunity to, to comment. And um, I think this is a, a very reasonable approach and uh, thanks for the time and consideration that went into it. Thank you, Michael. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, is there further comment from the board, questions, or a possible motion from the board? Uh, Kev, I, I have one just short question, and maybe Michael or Kate can answer this more appropriately, but I'm just wondering, is there a practical example that uh, that that someone can describe you know, that would require a process with the 30-day comment period prior to the board's action and 120 days after? Um, is there an example of something that would really, in, in the real world, take that long? When you said Michael or Kate, were you referring to Michael Durkin from Blue Cross? Yes. Okay. I mean, the, the, the Blue Cross was asking for the, the yes. extension yes. of the timeline. Michael, do you have a real life example? I don't have a. Um, real life example from practice but where i could see this coming up is when there's a requirement that is added where we don't necessarily have the exact field that we retain currently so there would need to be a code written to map back to what the appropriate field is on our end and i i just from experience know that that process takes time and also coordinating to make sure that the requirements actually align. Kate, do you have anything further to add? Uh, I would only add that um, when we did our um, research and how other states are approaching this, it was similar to the way we've got the um, the language uh, worded now. And so, um, although I don't have a specific example to share for you, Tom, I would say that um, it's it's pretty common to have a, uh, a period of time um, to allow for implementation and for testing um, that that would be sufficient uh, and um, and we're we're lined up pretty well with uh, most other states that we looked at. That's Does helpful. That Thank you. Both. Sorry, Tom, I, I jumped over you. I, I was asking you if that answered your question. And I was telling you that it did. <laughs> so <laughs> we, were, we were jumping over each other at the same time. <laughs> is there other board comment or questions, or is there a motion? I can move to approve the draft uh, Rule 8 on data submission and Rule 9 on data release with the changes discussed in our board meeting today as replacements for Bishka Rule H-2008-01 and uh, that we instruct our staff and legal teams to proceed with the formal rulemaking process under the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act for both rules. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the uh, motion was carried unanimously. Thank you, Russ. Next, we're going to turn to a discussion on value-based payments and uh, their role. Um, 
especially the FQHC and the all-payer model and the role of uh, possible capitated payments. So we're going to turn to Caitlin Thomas Hindle and Art Jones. And if you could begin by just introducing yourself to um, those in attendance today, and uh, whenever you're ready to proceed, please do so. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mullen. My name is Art Jones. I'm a primary care physician, worked with a community group and started a community health center on the west side of Chicago back in 84. And we transitioned from fee-for-service to primary care capitation in 1987, and I practiced under that for 25 years. Um, and so speaking from that experience, we also were under an advanced alternative payment methodology in addition to primary care capitation. Um, and then left in 2011 to create a Medicaid ACO, which I'm still chief medical officer for, which is 12, F 12 federally qualified health centers and three health systems in Chicago. We have 160,000 Medicaid beneficiaries that we are also paid primary care capitation and shared risk for total cost of care. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, the opportunities to actually improve patient outcomes and improve patient access to care under that model. And I'll turn it over to uh, have Caitlin introduce herself. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Caitlin Thomas Henkel. I'm a principal at Health Management Associates. I'm a clinical social worker. I have a blended experience, as I like to say. I practiced clinically for a number of years uh, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I also worked in state government and municipal government in uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And I've been spending the last, I don't know, about 10 years working as a consultant, supporting states and providers in value-based payment arrangements, uh, behavioral health integration. I worked with a number of states um, on the state innovation model initiative through CMMI. And currently I do a lot of coaching on practice transformation um, and advancing VBP. So it's nice to meet all of you and we're, we're delighted to be here with you all today. Um, before we dive in, I want to check, should I share my screen or is someone on your end going to share the slides? So, um, Abigail, can you answer that question? Yes, it's preferred if you could share them just because it's easier for you to talk back and forth, but I am prepared to if you would like me to. Okay, terrific. Um, I think I lost the button that said assume control or something in that regard. So, let's see here. Abigail, I might need your assistance. Um, I'm not seeing that control is not on my screen now. I think if you go to the uh, dot, dot, dot in the uh, toolbar, you should be able to find it. Am I correct, Abigail? Caitlin, I, I can share it. Are you okay, me? thanks. Sorry, sorry about that. All right. All right. Everybody seeing my screen okay? Perfect. We yes. Are. Okay, one thing to note up front, just in terms of terminology, we recognize that APM is a term that we use uh, to mean one thing, but recognizing that in Vermont, it has a whole nother meaning. So when we say APM, um, we're meaning alternative payment model, whereas we know yours refers to um, the all payer uh, model. So I just wanna say that up front when we say that, just in terms of uh, definitions, but we'll do our best to not use acronyms so it's not confusing. So a few things that we're hoping to achieve today, um, you can see there on the agenda, is really reviewing some state initiatives. We're going to do an overview at somewhat of a high level to talk about some various state models for alternative payment models. Um, we're going to speak to the limitations of fee-for-service reimbursement and how do you provide that optimal care, as Art talked about, improving care for patients and, and really advancing that. And then we're going to describe an alternative payment model that's been used uh, for both primary care and behavioral health services that can be used to improve patient access to care. And finally, we'll touch upon those linkages between primary care methodologies and the expanded use of the primary care workforce and, and driving those two things that go hand in hand uh, in tandem. Next slide, please. Okay, so we like to start with what is the data telling us as it relates to primary care? 
So this is an IOM report um, that, that's from 1996. So um, that was a long time ago, right? Doing the math over 20 years ago, this report laid out the foundation for primary care as being accessible, timely, coordinated, long-term and holistic um, to treat many of the most chronic conditions and majority of people. So population health approach and really reducing those obstacles for folks to obtain primary care. So that's what this laid out in 1996, this IOM report. If you're curious, I'd encourage you to check it out. Next slide, please. So let's look at what the data is telling us. So a report, a UDS report from 2019 looked at how are we doing as it relates to hypertension, diabetes, and depression. And as you can see, um, over a third of hypertensive patients still have a blood pressure of 140 over 90. Not ideal. Diabetics. Uh, almost a third of FQHC diabetic patients had an A1C of over 9. Really not great in terms of uncontrolled diabetes. And depression, um, until recently, with a lot of federal efforts that we're seeing with CCBHCs and, and other efforts at FQHCs specifically, uh, majority of FQHCs were not tracking PHQ-9s for depression um, on an ongoing basis. So definitely some room for improvement there. Next slide, please. So let's look at pre-pandemic, what was happening as it relates to trending for primary care among adults. So this data I want to say up front, this is from um, an eight-year period of 2008 to 2016, and it is with a commercial population. However, some interesting trends here. So a uh, decrease of primary care visits by almost 25%. So a decline, as you can see, um, primary care preventative visits increased, interestingly, by 40%, but that's only among one in five individuals. So it's distinct to a certain segment of the population. We'll talk a little bit more about demographics a bit there. And problem-based visits, in addition, declined by 30%. However, the proportion of adults with no primary care visits in a given year rose to 46%, so an increase, an 8% increase. And then looking at visits for low acuity conditions decreased by almost 50%. So I think it's some interesting data for us to, to pay attention to. Now let's dig into a little bit about pre-pandemic, what we were seeing among the demographics. So youngest adults, biggest decline there, 27%. Those who are healthy, right? Generally healthy without chronic conditions and living in lowest income areas. Now it's interesting, we're gonna talk about some healthcare disruptors later and where we're seeing some of these, the Walgreens, the clinics that across the, the nation really emerge they're targeting areas where we're seeing some of these trends in terms of lowest income areas where they're setting up shop and different things. Out-of-pocket costs for this commercial population also rose 31% for problem-based visits, but declined for those preventative care visits. Um, specialists remained kind of stagnant, but, um, and we'll talk about this, Visits to alternative venues, so urgent care clinics, increased by 47%. And I can say in my state, where I live now, I'm a, I'm a fellow former New Englander, but I live in New Jersey, we have seen a tremendous increase in urgent care clinics, the nationals setting up shop here, competing with some of the health systems that had had their urgent care clinics. So uh, convenience is a factor we'll talk about later in terms of primary care and what we're seeing with trends. So what are other states doing as it relates to alternative payment model? This is at a high level, but we wanted to do a bit of a flyby, and you may be very familiar with some of these. So Colorado established its regional accountable entities three years ago. Those RAIS, as they're known, um, are accountable for physical and behavioral health care of Medicaid members in Colorado. They have a network uh, for behavioral health services, primary care. They contract with community mental health centers as well as private behavioral health. And as you can see there, there's a $4 uh, PMPM PM for payment that's tied to specific quality measures. And there's also an administrative fee of just shy of $16 that's paid as well. 
And that covers, that $4 covers um, the cost of coordinating care for members. And there's a, a, it's deposited into a pool and there are certain performance metrics in terms of uh, getting you know, some incentive payments. Connecticut has a PCMH Plus program. Um, and for those of you that may be familiar with Connecticut, they have um, an ASO type of, of model, um, administrative services organization model. Um, but this PCMH model is essentially, they have metrics such as ED utilization, wellness screenings, medication management, behavioral health screenings. Um, they started with two waves, but they had to hold off due to the pandemic. Um, in the year two, the performance there um, for three out of six of the quality measures was roughly just shy of 15 million in savings. And six of those 14 networks of the FQHCs and the CBOs um, earned the, the savings, a portion of those savings. Next slide, please. So Delaware is emerging in terms of they issued guidance, gosh, I think maybe six, seven months ago, related to their um, APMs for Medicaid managed care that will begin this summer, or they're set to begin this summer, that will include either a shared savings or a shared risk arrangement. So that's emerging in that um, we're, we're watching closely. Idaho um, has the, uh, value care organizations that share savings and losses, and that too was um, you know, delayed due to the pandemic. And Iowa, Iowa planned to initiate their ACOs um, in 2016, but instead they shifted and moved to a managed care program um, that requires ACO in a risk-based arrangement. Um, and there were some um, changes that were made due to low premium rates um, and some losses. So they had to do some recalculations to ensure that uh, it was more actuarially sound. Maine, uh, your neighboring state, as you may all be aware, you're probably familiar with the Accountable Communities Program, uh, Shared Savings. Um, they have sh shown some um, you know, savings in terms of created 6,700,000 uh, in savings, and um, roughly just under a million was shared with the ACs. Still waiting for calculations. They haven't yet been published. And then Massachusetts DISRIP, <coughs> um, that model, is one of the more complicated models, I'll say. Uh, 17 ACOs across the Commonwealth participate. There's three different models that includes the MCOs and MassHealth, their Medicaid agency. And that includes 75% of their managed care uh, members. And interestingly, they have a model that's very focused on uh, partnerships with their CPs, their community partner agencies, that's really focused on complex individuals with behavioral health or those needing LTSS services. We're still waiting to see the financials uh, for the Massachusetts District Program. And then last but not least, <coughs> Minnesota is probably one of the models that's, I'll say more mature, having launched it in 2013. Um, and they've seen some um, outcomes in terms of their ED visits roughly down 7%, hospitalizations, 400 million um, in savings to date. And Oregon CCOs finally under their 1115 waiver. Um, that program has 15 CCOs that operate all over Oregon. Um, they have a cap, as you may be aware, at 3.4% growth per year. And then their quality bonus pool has all kinds of various measures associated with it that the CCOs can, can earn um, related to behavioral health, um, primary care, other incentive measures. Um, so that's an additional one we wanted to share. One thing to say about all these models, and <coughs> I'll segue into to art, is that majority of these models were built off of a fee-for-service chassis. So while there is you know, still that strong incentive to drive volume in many cases, um, there's, there's still challenges, right, in terms of with traditional billing and coding systems. So we want to mention that up front, that these our models, they're maturing. We're seeing them really change and transition over the years, but majority of them were built off of a fee-for-service chassis. And I'll now segue to my colleague, uh, Art Jones. Thanks, Caitlin. So I think what you've seen with the various state um, efforts is some checkered outcomes. Certainly, um, 
nothing that kind of blows you away. And I think that really, as you look over the last decade in terms of, of CM, CMS and CMMI and all of their innovative payment methodologies is I think they've learned, they've learned some lessons. There's been some success. They certainly have found that this is not an overnight thing that it takes providers um, time often three years plus to adjust to a new payment methodology and start to perform in terms of improve certainly financial outcomes. But I think what we're what payers are increasingly recognizing is that perhaps we got the steps out of order. That traditionally what happens in value-based payment is you start you start with a fee for service system and you will pay some pay for performance around some quality metrics and then kind of transition up to some shared savings. Maybe maybe put the providers at some limited risk and shared risk, um, with the hope that eventually they'll get to to population payments. But now you're seeing that these payers are recognizing that there is a there is a limitation when you up through category three because it's built on a fee for service system. Um, and so you're seeing, for example, CMS, their newest model, which is the direct contracting model, which is catching lots of attention and lots of participation, is moving to at a minimum primary care capitation. You're seeing, I'm working in several states across the country with federally qualified health centers and their primary care associations to create a capitated APM. Um, and because really, if, as long as you're under a fee-for-service system, you continue to chase the incentives that are related to that. With hoping hey, maybe 18 months after the beginning of the year, I'll see some shared savings. But in the meantime, I have to pay my staff, I have to pay my bills, and I'm used to doing fee-for-service. I think that not only are, are payers realizing the limitations of that pre-pandemic, we also saw that providers realized that what they thought was safe, namely fee-for-service um, reimbursement, was not so safe under a pandemic condition as well. But I think the real driving force about this is is really in terms of population health and prunes of access. And so the real the real movement, the real rationale for moving to a capitated system is: Can I improve access to care? Can I improve um, uh, patient outcomes? Can I better use my full care team to improve the health of, the, of our of our communities? So, you know, if you look pre-pandemic and you ask these questions, where providers asking patients to come in when a call or patient portal will suffice. Uh, I think you'd have to say the answer is yes, and the proof of that is certainly now that we have pretty much we've, providers have pretty quickly pivoted, and so have patients pivoted over to to telehealth services. Um, so certainly, if, as we look back now, there certainly were times we're asking people to travel, um, which is not always the most convenient thing, particularly for low income people, and particularly in states like Vermont, um, where where transportation and travel uh, can be significant distances. Um, is that, you know what, yes, we were asking people to come in and sit in our waiting rooms when, in fact, maybe a telehealth visit would have would have equally sufficed. Um, was that contributing to no-show rates? Um, I think we'd have to answer the question is yes. I mean, when our rides don't show up or something else occurs and we have other priorities, um, often, often we have with issues with family care, et cetera, is that if we could do that visit from home, um, then we're, we're likely to keep that visit. And again, our experience in this last year during the pandemic with relaxed rules in terms of telehealth, we've really seen that the show rates have increased uh, pretty much across the board and, and, and we're seeing much fewer no-shows. What's the financial impact though when, when providers um, turn around and do that, particularly when they start to do what I think we want them to do, which is we really want patients to learn to self to self monitor their conditions, um, to self manage their conditions with support from their practices. The problem is to the extent that you do that, that's not reimbursable under a fee for service system that restricts per payment to in person um, or at least face to face visits with a billable member of the care team, not every member of the care team. So we, as we look across the country, there are examples of systems that have moved um, um, to, a, to a system that is primary care cap and actually capitated for most systems like Kaiser. Um, and, you're, and as we look at their experience, what they've done over the, over the last decade plus is to move more and more of their encounters over to a virtual, to a virtual mess. My, my daughter's a type 1 diabetic. She was in the Kaiser system in Atlanta. Um, she went from having to go and take off work to go see the endocrinologist to manage her type 1 diabetes to go and seeing the endocrinologist once a year, the eye doctor once a year, and her primary care doctor once a year. And all the rest of her diabetes and her management of her insulin pump and, and control of her diabetes was all done virtually um, by a non-billable member of that care team who was highly qualified and trained in helping her adjust her, her pump. Um, and I can tell you her hemoglobin A1C was never better than it was in that system.
But what, what's also happening in, across our market is that we realize that other service industries are pretty far ahead, ahead of where healthcare is. I mean, if you had asked me, you know, five, 10 years ago, would I, when I go on vacation, when I, instead of going to a hotel, would I be renting someone else's house? I would have said, you're crazy. I thought it'll never happen. I mean, we're, I'm old enough to remember when, when the only way that you could go and see um, a, a movie was to go to a theater and there's still people that love to go to theaters. And once in a while, it's kind of fun to go to a theater. Um, but theaters show a movie at a certain time and it has to fit to their schedule, not not to not to my schedule. And so we've seen that evolve from theaters only to Blockbuster, which is now out of business to to because it became more convenient for Redbox to go for you to go to a kiosk and get the movie. And now we're all streaming the movies when they're most convenient to us. We've all seen with 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 the retail industry is that our shopping has has moved predominantly away from bricks and mortar shopping to online shopping. Banking, I'm old enough to remember when I used to take my paper check that I get issued twice a week, go stand in line at the teller to get my cash and paid for everything pretty much by cash or by check. We don't do any of that now. It's, and again, so these other service industries have sort of redesigned themselves to make sure to, in response to consumers to say, what's the most convenient way for you to access my services? And if they didn't make that transition, they, they basically went out of business. Well, what we're seeing now in healthcare is those same individuals that have learned something in other service industries are, are partnering up with, with often venture capitalists, other sources of capital, and with providers to come and say, we're going to offer a different way of providing access to care. So a good example, I think one that what Caitlin men mentioned was Walgreens announced a little, little less than a year ago that they were going to invest a billion dollars and start 500 clinics across the country. No longer clinics are just urgent care clinics. These are these are continuity of care primary care clinics with 24-7 telehealth availability. They looked and sort of said, this is what the consumer wants. And they're not being paid on a fee-for-service basis. They're going and contracting with payers um, for total cost of care um, so that they're no longer limited to say, yeah, it really makes sense for me to do telehealth, but I'm worried that maybe after the pandemic that audio-only telehealth is going to go away. And so I'm going to just stick to the to the in-person system. They are contracting in a way that allows them to provide the most flexible um, and convenient access to care for their for patients. And they're going to compete. They are increasingly competing with other care providers based on this on this convenience model. At the same time, I think we're realizing, and, and you probably feel this very acutely in Vermont, is that there already is a significant um, primary care workforce shortage. Um, the physician um, pipeline is is totally inadequate as far as our future needs, and it's been made up to some extent by the increase in um, nurse practitioners and PAs. But the projections all is that there will be a significant. There already is a, a, a shortfall, particularly in rural areas, um, uh, and in and in low income areas in terms of primary care access, and that will only increase and get worse um, in the coming years. I mean, the data for 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 rural settings is that. Now, more than half of rural areas defined by five or 500 or fewer um, patients per square mile uh, are in are in healthcare shortage areas, and that will only increase as our population ages, um, which means that it's the elder population that will take more and more time for primary care providers, um, and at the same time, the pipeline producing them. Uh, and I think we've seen that indeed often when there's those areas, whether they're rural or they're low income, that they're they have higher Higher area, higher rates of uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, and that that was a major contributor to the disparities we saw in terms of of hospitalizations and death from the pandemic. So we're all more and more aware of the fact that you know that that there are disparities, um, and the we have to address this by looking at okay, how are we going to change the delivery system, particularly the primary care and behavioral health delivery system, um, to really meet the needs and expectations of our population. Finally, I would sort of say that you know um, we've also realized is that for us to for us to in in medically underserved areas, rural areas, low income areas, is that we need to take a care team approach. We've all kind of bought into the patient centered medical home um, approach, which is a care team approach that is more member centric, not physician centric. Um, but the problem is that there are things that we could use other care team members to do in terms of tasks, but we can't do that because, in fact, you know what, if we did that, um, there's no reimbursement for it. So I think a good example is, is Caitlin showed you that, that um, for example, FQHCs, that more a third of their patients had blood pressures above 140 over 90. 
Um, it turns out nationally, if you go on the American Hearts um, website, you'll see that three quarters of patients with high blood pressure have a blood pressure more than 130 over 80. So although NCQAs kind of use the cutoff 140 over 90, what the American Heart Association says is that we should have people's blood pressure less than 130 over 80. That's only happening one out of four times. So what do they recommend? They recommend that patients um, get blood pressure monitors, they self-monitor at home, and that they are supported from their practices. What the support from the practices means, it could mean that, hey, you know what, if you're in rural Vermont, support means that you that you check your blood pressure at home and then you get in the car or get someone else to pick you up and you travel over to my to my office and sit in my waiting room and I'll look at your blood pressure results. Or it could mean that, in fact, support means that a community health worker um, who's very capable and trained in hypertension and, and, and um, lifestyle changes um, is, is having regular contact with that patient, going over the results, and when in fact the patient's home blood pressure results um, are, are consistently elevated and they're compliant with their meds and doing the best they can with lifestyle, that there's a conversation between that community health worker and a nurse who then has a conversation with the primary care provider and they make a change in medication. None of that requires that patient to leave their home and go and sit in, in, the, in, the, patient, in the provider's um, waiting room. Um, so you can start to see that there are, and whether that's hypertension, whether that's it's diabetes, whether it's depression, whether it's asthma, a lot of these chronic conditions can be managed. And I'm not saying that there's not a role for a face-to-face -face visit with primary care providers. We still, the majority of primary care visits, if, if it requires you putting a stethoscope on someone's chest or filling someone's belly, requires an in-person visit. But let's change, let's reserve those visits and reserve that capacity for people that need that. Let's not be be eating up that capacity by things that other care team members can do in a more convenient fashion for their patients. So the models that that are evolving really are our are, are collaborative care models um, where there is now a team approach between the primary care provider and a community health worker. Um, or between a behavioral health clinician and a community health worker that is making regular contact with the patient remotely. Um, we've implemented that model for, um, for depression at our ACO over the last four years. We've had over 3,700 patients um, whose PHQ-9 was more than 10 with a confirmed diagnosis of depression, who by enrolling in that program, um, over 54% of them have seen their PHQ-9 drop by more than half and 34% of them have seen their PHQ-9 drop less than five, which is considered remission. Those are, those are outcomes that are really hard to match any place in the, in, the, in the literature. And we're doing that with a community health worker, not with the traditional model that's first developed, use a behavioral health clinician um, to make those contacts with patients between visits. You know, there's not enough behavioral health clinicians for us to be able to do that. Um, to, we need them to be doing the counseling. Let's use community health workers to be contacting the members. And often because they're from the community, those patients will relate to them and communicate with them. Um, if there is a ling linguistic problem because they're speaking a different language and you get a community health worker that speaks that language, it's so much better than having to use an interpreter, et cetera. So we started with depression. Um, we've now rolled it into, into hypertension. We're now starting to do it with diabetes. There's lots of chronic conditions. Or you can, if you think about where the model is going to go in terms of nurse triage, right now for a practice to hire a nurse so that they can talk to a patient and sometimes say, you know, this is what you need to do. You don't really have to come in. Well, what I've done is I've added the expense of a nurse um, to, in fact, reduce my revenue under fee for service. So you start to see that a lot of the outcomes that we're getting and the fact that people are being pushed to urgent care centers are going to emergency rooms because we haven't set up the systems that allow them to provide access to care and support in the most convenient fashion for them in the most efficient fashion for us as a delivery system. So it's hard for me to look and and again, I practiced under this model for 25 years, um, so I was convinced early on um, but it's, it's hard for me not to look at this or say, you know what, the current fee-for-service system is a barrier to meeting, to maximizing patient outcomes. It's a barrier to me being able to use my full care team and the most efficient factor. factor. It's a barrier to people having timely and convenient access to care. And we're realizing across the market is that there are healthcare competitors that are starting to, that have recognized that are implementing models. And so we either have to change or, or someone will come in and, and compete with us directly, which maybe that's what it will take, hopefully not for us to get, to get our attention. So that's really from a primary care um, standpoint. I, so as I mentioned, um, our ACO, and it's been, I'm, I'm done here just a couple of minutes, our, our ACO is 13 FQACs and three health systems. 
um, with our 50, 157,000 lives. The way that we get paid is we are paid primary care capitation for our primary care services. We actually believe that care management belongs at the practice level, not from a telephonic uh, approach by a health plan. And so we are NCQA certified for um, care management and we are completely delegated for care management down to our practice level. So those dollars flow down to the primary care practices who hire a community, a community health worker and a, and a care manager to do the care management of our complex patients. We do get some pay for performance around some of the quality metrics that the state um, um, thinks are important, and we're under a shared risk arrangement. So we have all the obligation to be able to say, you know what, we need to provide access to care in the most efficient manner um, so that we can reduce, we can improve the outcomes, um, be able to gain access to those quality incentives, and at the same time um, do well from a total cost of care because we can eliminate some of the avoidable utilization and cost. So how does the primary care cap work is basically um, is you take, for example, if you were to move into this is you would take your primary care revenue from a typical year um, for, for a practitioner. Um, so 2020 is not a typical year. You would take a 2019 um, and then you would divide that by the number of member months in terms of patients that were assigned to you as primary care provider. Um, and then you would you would inflate that at a, at a rate that is affordable to, um, to the to the state or to the payer. Um, if if the primary care provider, depending on their size, if they're large enough, then you don't have to add a risk adjustment pool because their risk adjustment is, is pretty stable from year to year. But in other places where there are small practices, you would introduce a risk adjustment factor. Um, up to this point, risk adjustment has been pretty much based on disease burden, but we realize that increasingly that social drivers of health have a lot to do with risk as well. So to the extent that we're doing in Chicago is we are systematically collecting social drivers of health of information in terms of those barriers to care across our population. So our, we have about 90% about compliance in terms of collecting the information, and we're increasingly using that for risk stratification as well. What does that mean as far as outcomes? So in Illinois, there are, four, um, there are five uh, health plans that do Medicaid. The one we're contracted with, we have 40% of their members. They were ranked the highest quality pr uh, provider in the um, in the state. Um, it based on 21 metrics, which are a combination of kind of preventive measures, chronic disease measures, but a lot of patient satisfaction measures as well um, using CAP score. And so they scored the top in the country of the 21 metrics. So our ACO outscored the rest of that health plan on 17 out of 21. So using this approach really has improved patient satisfaction with care. It's improved patient outcomes um, as measured by these by these metrics. And then in terms of in terms of other outcomes, I think you'd be interested in it is we we've, we've now have completed five years of where we've actually been paid our shared savings. We've been at it for seven, as you probably realize, there's a lag again between when you, the year is completed and when you when you when you generate savings. But we've generated for our members that started off in the beginning. Um, and back in 2014, we had less than 100,000 lives, um, so it's gradually grown. But over that five year period of time, we've generated after paying for our back office, after paying for our care management is so we've generated close to $80 million in savings. How do we do that? Well, we reduce inpatient days by a third, inpatient hospitalizations by a, by a quarter, um, 30 day readmissions by 12%, ER visits by 11%. And you do that by increasing primary care visits by 10%. You do that by being responsible for total cost of care means that when someone's in the emergency room, as I make contact the next day and find out, okay, did they do they need to be followed up? If so, I get them in the next day. If they need to be followed up with a telehealth visit, they get a telehealth visit. If it's really an education to say, hey, did you realize that you know you went in there for your for your um for your back pain or for your headache? Um, but did you realize that you could have actually been much more convenient and you could have called the practice um, and that you would have talked to a nurse who either would have would have would have uh, dealt with your issues or would have passed you on to a telehealth visit or would have said if your condition requires an inpatient visit, excuse me, in-person visit, that we would got to visit the same day. So it's really doing that type of follow-up um, with patients um, um, to eventually let them know, hey, you know what, you have a better option than to be running to the emergency room for not emergent issues. So, um, so I just want to emphasize that what we've learned in terms of value-based payment, though, is that payment methodologies changes don't change outcomes. 
they facilitate outcomes. They make it possible. So the models I told you about are, are possible because of a different way in payment. But it really comes down to practitioners kind of deciding, you know, how am I going to change the way I offer access to my services? How am I going to relate across the continuum of care to work with specialists, to work with the hospitals um, during transitions of care, to exchange information in a timely fashion so that we get better patient outcomes? So our ACO um, has a structure, and I won't spend a lot of time with this, but has a committee structure. It has has groups that are working iteratively uh, on a basis to figure those things out. What's our new model going to be? How do we improve care management? How do we really take advantage and use the, the workforce, the alternative workforce more effectively? How do we train them? How do we exchange information in a timely fashion? How we do? Um, how do we engage our patients in managing themselves better? And then again, how do we? How does that turn into changing the incentive system that we pay our individual um, provider entities? So, just in the last slide, this is our clinical committee. So each of our each of our sixteen practices chooses a provider champion that is responsible for coming up with the mo this model of care for our ACO. So they are they spend half a day every week just on on ACO activities. They sit on the clinical committee that meets every month for two hours, and they also populate along with other other members of the practices these other subcommittees. So we have a subcommittee that just looks at ED utilization, looks at the data, identifies the opportunity, comes up with a recommendation, which goes back to the clinical committee, and they say, yeah, this is the approach we're going to take as an ACO to deal with frequent ED utilizers or or et cetera. And then this responsibility of those provider champions, not only to approve the standard of care, but to take it back to their practices and implement it. So that's really what it takes um, for us to be to be successful. So I'll stop at this point um, and open it up for um, for questions. OK, okay questions, questions to the board. I have a couple of questions, but if somebody else wants to go first, that's OK. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I had a, a couple of questions um, for, well, first in reaction to some of the data that you shared, Caitlin, um, you had talked about the decrease in primary care visits and also some of the disruptors. So my takeaway there was that not necessarily to some extent, there were some people where there was no utilization, but it wasn't so much re overall reductions in utilization. It was shifting, people were shifting where they got care. So instead of getting care from their regular primary care provider, they were choosing some of these alternative venues. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. So yes, seeing a shift in terms of where they were going, right? Increased use of urgent care clinics of the other types of models. Yes, not. And this is so let me say this up front pre pandemic. So I want to just emphasize the time sure. frame for this was 28 yeah. 2008 to 2016. So I want to note that as well. But Art, did you have an additional point? Yeah, I would just add what that what that didn't show was because it was practice. It didn't show what was happening to ED utilization, which pretty in many areas across the country was also increasing at the same time. So I think what you were seeing was that people were shifting to to urgent care sites, whether it's the urgent care center or an emergency room for what really could be done in a primary care office. OK, thanks. Yeah, and I think at least uh, one of my concerns about that kind of shift would be continuity of care, really yeah. the patient having the support that they need for managing their own condition, as well as um, having that relationship with the primary care provider. Yeah, yeah, duplication of duplication of testing you know, medical errors because you know, the patient went to the urgent care center, forgot their bottle of medicines, and then somebody puts them on a different medicine that interacts with it. I mean, there's lots of problems with with lack of continuity and lack of exchange of information. Thank you. Um, Art, I had a question about um, your delegated care management. I was interested in um, that model because we have, as you may know, um, in Vermont, a, a primary care medical home program called the Blueprint health, which is also paired with a regional community health team to provide those sorts of wraparound supports from mental health and other areas. And certainly with our ACO program, the care management is also a delegated uh, to the practice level model. So I was just curious to hear a little bit more about that in terms of challenges, what, um, you know, certainly I have my opinion about why 
you know, Vermont kind of went that way, but sort of pros and cons of that model. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm certainly like the Vermont model. I think the typical model across the country is it's done by a health plan from a telephone and that does not yeah. work. Okay? I mean, we're not going to change people's behavior unless we build a face-to-face -face relationship that they can trust us. Then we have built the ability. So, the, so the, the advantage of having a primary care is that to the extent that there is a, a trusting relationship between the the patient and the primary care provider is that the community health worker care coordinator care manager can build on that relationship. It allows me as a primary care provider, when I see a patient, I think I'm managing the diabetes and hypertension, but they tell me about, about domestic abuse that I can open the door and there is a community a, a care manager that can help me. It doesn't mean there's advantages to being out in the community because there's people that don't go into the primary care office. So we actually have a combination. So we have a hybrid model, particularly for our population that has an SMI or SUD diagnosis that keeps that's poorly controlled because they don't show up in primary care. So we have boots in the round relationship with with community based um, care coordinators or care managers to manage some of that population. Thank you. Um, and then my last question is really around um, whether either of you uh, would have any thoughts on sort of what uh, what is appealing or not appealing to an FQHC in particular, as opposed to any other type of practice around uh, sort of moving into a capitated model. Because certainly, you know, some there it's certainly something that has been slow to develop here in Vermont. So I'm just curious about what those pressures are from the FQHC lens in particular. Yeah. So um, first of all, to be able to really fully use your care team is really important. I think we also are from if I'm an FQHC, I'm worried about can I compete with health systems in terms of my primary care teams? So I can't afford, I can't I'll pay them in terms of salaries and benefits. I don't have the resources to do that. So I'm going to have to and that really goes not just for the primary care providers but for other members of the care team as well. And so I'm going to have to give them job satisfaction um, to be able to um, to offset the fact I can't pay them as much. So to me, it's 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 can I impact a larger population? I mean, I have a I have a client. We did this model in Washington State. I had a rural area that one of the FQCs had an average visits of 1.8 when visits per member per year, where everyone else was averaging three. Well, why was that? Because they couldn't get primary care providers there, so patients are going to the ED. So if I could use my primary care providers more efficiently and have other care team members do things that you know what they're very capable of doing or I can train them to do so I can do things that I'm most trained to do that is a satisfier for me as well as doing a better job of improving the population health and it's also just to know freeing up the the prescribers freeing up the physicians and that job satisfaction there as well so as Art talked about the clinical there's a clinical transformation piece with this right it's not just the payment you have to do the work in terms of training the staff but the job satisfaction in terms of on the physician prescriber side as well as the ma's your social workers your other frontline staff and being able to do things more flexibly and work to the top of either their license or, or their ability if they're non-licensed as well thank you okay other board members Uh, yeah, I had a question on the projected savings, the 79.3 million in projected savings. Can you talk about how those phase in and who's recognizing them and are people acknowledging that they are seeing savings? Um, so, you know, so I guess if you looked at kind of how much are you getting each year? Yeah, so I should have changed it. It's no longer projected. And when I made that slide initially, it was projected. They've actually been paid now. Um, okay. So so it's it's no longer projected we got savings from year one um, i think when you look at medicare acos across the country it's the it's the exception rather than the rule to generate savings in the first year often you're not you're getting to like half of them generating savings after three years there is a learning curve to this we were just fortunate enough to be able to um to um, earn savings in the first year those savings um are split 50 50 with the payer um, and so like that last year, the year that um, ended in June of 20, um, where there was a little over 29 million in savings, the payer kept half of it and we kept half of it. We met our quality benchmarks. They kept half. We kept half. OK, great. Thanks. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Other questions from the board? 
Yeah, I have uh, one or two. Um, you know, back on slide 13, where you showed the steps to uh, from fee for service uh, at the first box to the um, fixed perspective payments at, at, at the end, I think making legitimate a point that weaning the system from fee for service is difficult. It's, um, but uh, that is the um, situation that I think we're in here in Vermont is we're on that path to try to do that. But one thing I don't think we have is any sense of what the proportion of payments should be that are fixed prospective payments that begin to kick in the benefits of access and um, uh, innovation and efficiency that we all hope 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 we can can achieve. So, you know, just assuming that. Most people are on board that the network um, components that you talk about in terms of an integrated network are reasonably in place as as one climbs that ladder to fixed prospective payment. What um, what what should we be looking for as kind of the guiding light in terms of 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 what how, how much that should comprise a provider's uh, income? Yeah. Yeah, good. So I think there are there. I want to answer that from two perspectives. If you look at what CMS has done with their demonstrations, they started with CPC, they went to CPC plus, they went to primary care first, and then they went to direct payments. And what they found in each each of those each of those demos, a higher percentage of the primary care practices revenue for Medicare patients was tied to capitation. And what what did they get in terms of outcomes? They got they didn't get statistically significant savings on CPC or CPC plus. It's still too early for primary care first. But the reason they went to direct payment is they felt like, you know what, it's it, you can't have your foot in, on the dock and in the boat. Am I going to chase fee for service or am I going to do population health on the capitation? So that's one answer to your question. The second answer, though, really comes down to what percentage of my panel does this apply to? And that's where Vermont is so unique. Because the challenge is that for me, to, if I'm going to put in nurse triage, if I'm going to do remote management, I'm not going to look at someone's payer class and sort of say, well, I'm not answering the call because you're with a commercial payer that's paying me food for service and this Medicaid's paying me caps, so I'll do nurse triage for them. So to the extent that you can capitalize on your multi-payer status in Vermont is a huge advantage for you because now I can put in one model of care, which is what the practitioners are going to do. They're going to, they're going to practice one model of care for their population. So I think it has to be on a multi-payer basis as well. Well, so, so, so let me get a little bit more specific. Uh, we know that across the uh, 14 hospitals here in Vermont, that um, in terms of their net patient revenue, about 14 to 15% of it is, is a fixed prospective payment or some kind of value-based payment. Um, is that enough or should we be at 20, 30 percent or 40 percent or. Yeah, yeah. So there's no there's no magic to it. But I guess my question would be is who's holding the risk? What often has happened across the country when there hasn't been success is that the risk has been held at the health systems and they are still paying their primary care providers and their specialists on a fee for service RVU basis. If the incentive down to them hasn't changed, you're not going to get the outcomes you want. You have to change the way you're paying the people that are doing the actual direct care. So I'm not so sure that it is it is that percentage or this percentage. It really is more, and that mistake is made. I mean, I have I have clients across the country that the health system say, well, you know, we'll take the risk. We'll take the risk and just pay them fee for service, and they're not doing very well. But they kind of say, well, that's the cost of doing business. That's the wrong way. Okay, the right way is to say, what incentive? What am I telling my my individual practitioners, seeing the patients, in terms of what I value? And that's what has to change. That's the whole point about the primary care cap. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board? Sure, uh, just a couple. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really uh, informative and helpful. Um, I'm actually wondering a little about the timeline for practice transformation once a practice transitions from fee-for-service to capitation. You know, it's obviously the design in part is to reduce low value care and increase high value care. And I'm wondering, you know, are there types of low value care that you see, you know, the low hanging fruit that drops first um, that, you know, other things take more time um, to develop? I'm just kind of wondering how that works, how quickly some yeah. of that low value care is dropped out and what types of low value care you've observed um, being eliminated once the payment structure changes. Yeah. So I think 
the low value care are things like people going to the emergency room for back pains and colds and UTIs and things that because they just it's not it's you can't and we turn around and blame the patients instead of sort of saying well what's wrong with the system well the system is that we didn't provide access or we said we had open access but if you didn't call in the first hour all those slots were gone so I think that goes I think that is 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 one of the first thing that, that goes. And that's where a lot of the savings, I mean, most of the savings that comes out of the shared savings program is related to hospital hospital revenue, okay? It's another big thing that drops is that we don't do a good job of managing people after hospital discharge. So there's not good communication. People go home, they had one bag of medicine at home, now they come home with a second bag of medicine, they don't know what to do. So there's no one's doing the med reconciliation. No one's making sure that the information from the hospital gets to the PCP or the behavioral health clinician when they follow up and they, and they often don't follow up. I mean, I can tell you from before, you know, as a primary care provider, I treat somebody and I was before the day of hospitals, I took care of my own patient in the hospital. I thought I explained to them that you need to go fill this prescription for an antibiotic for your pneumonia. And they come back three days later, the prescription in their hand. You know, it's that kind of thing where it's just like, okay, we're failing. Somehow I'm not communicating. We're not doing a right job. And that's where community health workers who maybe can do a better job than me and 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 really managing transition care and working with patients to self-manage themselves. And then I think you get to these things like, okay, does it really make sense for me to drag somebody in here to to get their blood pressure checked? I mean, 20% of people, when they walk through the front door, their blood pressure goes up. And as a PCP, I don't know, am I seeing your, is your blood pressure up because you have white coat effect or your, is your blood pressure up because it's always up? I don't know, I'll guess and I'll change your medicine. If I'm wrong, then I've got you on too much medicine. You go home and you feel weak and dizzy and then you blame the doctor and stop your medicine. Like, are we really that surprised that we're not doing, we're doing a poor job of managing hypertension? It's just right. not, it's not a, it's not a sane system. So I guess my follow-up question then would be, is there an upfront investment amount that you've identified prior to transition that would really aid these practices in, you know, for example, you know, they have to change their entire business model. They have to restructure staffing, make sure that they have relationships with behavioral health, make sure that there actually is a psychiatric, you know, provider that is even in the, in the area that can be accessed. They may need to invest in remote monitoring, telemedicine. I mean, all of these things take an upfront investment. And so I'm not talking about the PM, PM for care yeah. coordination. I'm talking about like before you even begin, you're changing the business model completely and that requires investment. Is there any evidence on what that amount needs to be, you know, per capita or how do we get our hands around that? And, and without it, is it possible? Yeah. So in 87, I didn't have the luxury of having an investment. Do I, do I think there needs to be investment? Yes. But there also has to be, okay, the first step for me is to look at what do I have my staff doing now and how does that change when I, when I change the, the reimbursement system? So first thing you don't do is go hire a bunch of new staff. You first kind of look and sort of say, how do I repurpose? Like, what's my model of care? So you need some time before you, before you jump into the capitation, you should be doing some planning. What am I going to do differently? Because if you don't do something differently, you're not going to get different outcomes, okay? So there's got to be that time for planning. And then there has to be, okay, let's look at the job descriptions and the workflows and let's see what I can do with the staff I have. And then, yes, you need to, you need, there needs to be some investment. I don't have, I can tell you our experience is that we, we started paying that care management fee um, up front and we had some infrastructure dollars that probably amounted to, I mean, it's blended because it's higher for complex patients than other, but probably bend it to, bend it, amount it to like $10 per member per month that gave them, that gave them enough money to start to say, okay, now I'm going to do care management. Now I'm going to redesign care. Um, and it is an iter process. You know, it is year after year. You don't suddenly just jump and do everything at once, but you do sort of thing one, one year at a time. You got to make sure that you're getting some of the savings on total cost of care. Then you would reinvest those savings into continuing to change your practice model. Got it. All right, I just, two more questions, and, and then I think I'm good. But one is you mentioned um, telehealth and the values of telehealth, and in terms of increasing access and better, you know, um, mm -hmm. disease management. Uh, I'm just wondering, there's there's probably some trade-offs there in the sense that it, it may have potential to increase costs in the sense that well, there's fewer no-shows, so then those are visits that are actually going to cost money, which is, I mean, a good thing that that people are getting care. So I don't want to uh, undervalue that, but. Uh, there's also some anecdotal evidence out there, I think, and maybe some evidence that will come out post-COVID about more specialty referrals that come from telehealth that may have been managed, you know, in the office without that specialty referral. And also, I think this came out the other day that nurses have a higher workload around telehealth 
um, and more administrative burden. So I'm just wondering what does that mean for, for burnout and workforce shortages? And so I'm just kind of thinking about how do we weigh the costs and benefits of telehealth in terms of access cost, burnout, um, workload, and all of that, yeah. you know, yeah. as we're thinking about this as a new model. Yeah, very good question. So what we did prior to the pandemic is we kind of figured out a care team approach and we had workflows and we had responsibilities. And then suddenly the pandemic was upon us, all right? And we had to pivot in literally, what, two weeks to start to offer telehealth. And as a result, we didn't have the ability, the time to actually do the redesign to sort of say, how are we going to take a team-based approach to telehealth? So that's, and then that leads to burnout. And it's not just the nurses. I'm hearing it from the the providers themselves to sort of saying, you know, I didn't used to have to do this. Now I got to do this. And they, I don't like telehealth because I got to do things that somebody else was doing before. So there's that issue. There's the issue in terms of what's going to get paid for after the emergency period for telehealth. And the so the problem with audio only telehealth is that it's much more open to abuse. And that's what the payers are saying. On the other hand, if you're in Vermont and you're in an area that doesn't have high speed internet, okay, or you're in a low income area that can't afford the devices or, or has doesn't have unlimited data man. So you've taken on with your with your visit. OK, it doesn't work as well. I'm concerned there's going to be more disparities in outcomes now based on the revision in telehealth rules. Well, the way around this pay primary care cap, because now what you've said is here's here's how much it costs us to provide access to primary care. Now, if you want to do it over over an audio only telehealth, if you want to do it video with audio if you want to do it over the patient portal if you want to bring them in face to face work it out work it out what's most convenient what's going to get you the best outcomes and it doesn't cost the payer anything more and you can be more efficient to sort of say well some of the stuff that i was having to use a doc for i'm going to use a community health worker for as long as it's clinically appropriate and people are trained let's use a care team approach um, but i think unless and then it has to be tied in my mind primary care cap has to be part of a total cost of care contract I think you use the two APMs together, right? So now I'm incentivized to sort of say, you know, if you pay me primary care cap, I'm have an incentive, but I'm also under shared savings or shared risk. I have an incentive to make sure I'm providing such good access people aren't going to the emergency room. And when I do a good job of keeping out of the emergency room, there are dollars to help me pay for that nurse as well. So I think you put the two of them together and you always have a quality component that is detecting if there's under provision of care. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I appreciate that answer. My last question is just around, you had talked about the capitation grew at an inflation rate, and I'm just wondering, you know, a lot of states, including, uh, unfortunately, Vermont, often the, the medical expenses don't rise with, from Medicaid, don't rise with the cost of yeah. medical inflation. So I'm yeah. wondering, has your experience been that the, the capitation has risen with the costs of delivering that care and risen at the, at the rate of medical inflation or no? And, and what should the appropriate, how should you tie that inflation rate? How should that inflation rate be set? Yeah. So I think, I think first of all, is that it realized that fee-for-service PPS rates for FQCs have risen at what's called the medical expense inflationary factor, which in any one year is like 0.8% to like 1.5%. I mean, it's nowhere keeping up. So the, so in some states that I work with that move their FQCs to capitation, they allow one-time rebasing where they do a cost report and bring their, bring their fee up to where it should be. And then they decide, OK, what am I going to inflate it at? So Washington State doesn't inflate the MBI. They inflate it a little bit higher than that. You decide as a state, you decide as a state, OK, do I, if you're like Oregon, do I, do I peg this to 3.4% growth? And that's what I want to do. And you peg it to whatever you want to increase that as a state. But okay. no, I don't think you can't inflate it at less than 1% and expect that it's going to keep up. Right. OK, thank you. Very helpful. You're welcome. Thank you, Jess. Robin, I understand you have another question. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I was curious in your ACO program where it's a mix of FQHCs and health systems and hospitals, uh, obviously you're generating the shared savings from reduced utilization at the hospital level. How do you keep the hospitals in the ACO? Yeah, so first of all, the hospitals have employed primary care providers, um, and so they're benefiting from that. Um, they also have specialists and we use e consult for example, so we figured out what's a more efficient way to use our specialists. I didn't have time to go into all that, but we look at how do we provide access to specialty care as well. Um, and then also, unlike Vermont, Chicago is a pretty competitive market in terms of we're overbedded, right? And so either you move down a path of being more efficient or you're going to become the next Kodak, right? I mean, so, so 
you have to you have to kind of think so if and quite frankly not every hospital was was interested in partnering with us because they didn't have the vision that in fact their future had to be that they were going to differentiate themselves by being high value so our partners have that vision thank you okay anything else from the board at this time i'm going to open it up for uh, public comment and i'm going to turn first to walter carpenter Hey, Kevin, thanks much. Um, thanks for the presentation. Just wanted to make a comment more than anything and all this talk about payers. It should be noted here that we, the people are the payers, not the insurance companies or the uh, public or, pro or Medicare or Medicaid, but we are the ones. They disperse it. Right. And it's an open question whether we need them or not. But in any case, so when you say the payers get 50% and the physicians get 50%, if they come over budget, then why aren't we getting that 50%? Because we yeah. are the ones who are the payers. Yeah, good question, Walter. And you're right, you are the payers. And so, and what's happening around the country is you as the ultimate payer and the consumer are demanding better service, okay? Actually, what happens when it happens, when we reduce total cost of care is the next year the premium gets adjusted down. Who's paying for that premium? Taxpayers are paying for that Medicaid premium. So mm -hmm. to the extent that we're more efficient, okay, and we drive down costs and they turn around and they do readjust the premium accordingly. So that is a way of making sure that it's coming back to the ultimate payer, which is you. Well, the real problem is our costs are going way up. You know, every year, insurance companies ask for a raise hospital fees go up our wages don't go up yeah so i am uh, i'm certainly sensitive that i'm not an expert on the vermont model so i don't want to comment right. on on the vermont model but i just thank wanted you. to make that note <laughs> thank you um dale hackett yes sorry Took me a second to find the mic. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very curious on how you do, in fact, interact with the specialists. Um, I have a lot of specialists, for examples, and I find that that's a real backbreaker is trying to get the primary care office and the specialists to actually communicate in order to create that plan of management on the primary care side. The other one I'm curious about is whether or not you run into workforce shortages. I, I thought I heard you say maybe once or twice that you did, but then again, it sounded like you had plenty of workforce. Um, the other one is, I did notice this, like when I used to go to get healthcare in Canada, Everything was in one place. This is years ago. Your pharmacist was right next to your doctor's office. You actually didn't have to move around that much. It was almost like there was a small mall that was nothing but healthcare. Um, because you mentioned Walgreens and how would they do deal with workforce shortages if they're going to offer services? But the other factor is when I call up to schedule an appointment, I often don't get my primary care doctor, but I get somebody on the team. If it is an appointment that needs to be that day or the next day, I'll often say, who's available? That's good enough. As long as they can manage the issue, that's good enough. I'm just saying it usually isn't the primary care doctor. That would be a two week out appointment. So how do you deal with those type of logistics? Yeah, okay. all, all good questions. So um, let me start with the first one, access to specialists. Um, so under a fee for service system, the specialists only get paid if they see you face to face. Well, it turns out, so we implement what's called e-consult, which is secure messaging between primary care and the specialist. Um, and about half of our specialist visits, uh, particularly to the cognitive specialist versus the procedural specialist, um, are managed virtually. 
And when they're not managed virtually, then at least it gives the opportunity for the specialist to say to the PCP, okay, before I see this patient, I need you to get this diagnostic test, because otherwise I'm going to see him and, and waste their time and send for the diagnostic test. So, so there is, and what the specialists like about it, it, particularly when there's a shortage of specialists, is that, first of all, the specialists will tell you lots of nightmares where people got at the end of the line. So they called and they could, you couldn't get in to see the specialist for three or four weeks, and the specialist then sees the patient and says, oh my gosh, if I'd only known. And we have pictures, we have a case, one of those, one case where a, a young man walked in with a, with a dark finger and had his melanoma resected in less than, in less than a week. That would have never happened in Chicago. I mean, you can't get in to see a dermatologist for six months, but the dermatologist saw that finger and said, my gosh, it looks like a melanoma. He got, he got that patient in, he got him in to see the surgeon, he got it resected. So, and the other thing the specialists like about it is that it's less resource intensive for them. And it also, it also, um, there's a hundred percent show rate with any console. Right. So I don't have to worry about the patient not showing up. I'm just I've got I've got the counsel. The time is convenient for me is I can access and, and respond. Our specialists are required to respond in less than 48 hours. So it's much more timely for us. So there is a rational way to do it. The problem with the problem with e-consult is that most payers don't reimburse for it and we're on a fee for service system. So you're seeing the more progressive models like you're going if you got to Utah and with Intermountain, you're seeing that they are moving towards capitating their specialists. That, there was a movement towards that back in the 80s and 90s. We moved away from that as we moved away from managed care. Now there is some interest in moving back. So that's really the issue of the, of the specialist. Um, in terms of the workforce is that we train the workforce. So if you're an FQC in the inner city of Chicago, don't wait for them to come you with a certificate. You basically hire people from the community and you start at the you start with them becoming the receptionist or the medical assistant to the lab tech and eventually you train them. So our ACO has a six month training program um, for our care coordinators, our community health workers, and they have to work and earn a salary. So they are given off two half days a month to come to the courses where we really are training them and teaching them and they get a certificate at the end. So it's really if you're if we're going to deal with the workforce issue, we have to be willing to invest and train that workforce. Don't expect somebody else to train them and they come to us. In terms of the one stop shop, that's the whole story of FQHCs, right? The whole story of FQHCs is that they have behavioral health, they have primary care, they have dental, many of them have optometry. Um, and so and so and people do want that. I mean, when there are surveys out, when we've surveyed patients, is often they are looking for that wide variety. And they don't want to have to be traveling in multiple places. So I think that one stop shop certainly resonates with a lot of our patients. Um, and then the last issue is primary care is a, that is again exactly the point in terms of primary care cap. So what happens right now is that most primary care practices have gone to open access. So they'll have a certain number of slots that they reserve for open access. Well, guess what? If you're if you happen to call in the first hour, then you've got a slot. And if you don't make it in the first hour, there's no more slots. Or maybe there's a slot with somebody else. We have to rationalize the system to sort of say, OK, if the ideal thing is that we want to reserve our primary care spots and reserve so you can see your own primary care provider, then I have to reserve those slots by by giving them to people that actually have to be seen face to face. But if my business model is that I got to make sure all those slots are full, I'm going to give them to whoever calls comes in. So what you'll see a lot of them do is they will the first people that call in, they're just given the slots. They're not even talking to a nurse. And then, and then those that can't get seen may or may not get to talk to a nurse or just kind of give an appointment for two weeks from now. So we have to rationalize the way that we're providing access and we're using our workforce, which we don't do under fee for service. Okay, Rick Dooley. Great, thanks so much. Um, that was actually pretty fascinating and you know, sort of highlighted a lot of the issues that um, I think Vermont sort of struggled with. Um, I actually have two questions. The first is, um, Early on, we talked about, or you talked about, um, uh, provider taking risk, and we always have a concern with um, primary care providers taking risk because we're sort of on the, you know, just on the line of financial viability as it is, and the idea of a risk-based system when we control so little of the cost. I know we can, you know, help reduce, um, you know, hospital readmissions certainly in transitions of care, but we're not big drivers in the cost of the overall system, and so if we have um, you know, big parts of the system that are so, so expensive that we can't impact, um, it's difficult to to have, uh, you know, sort of some of that risk assumed by the primary care providers. And I also, in in that same vein, when it comes to setting the PMPM, 
if I recall from your slides, it looked like you took sort of the total cost of care, divided it by the number of, of uh, members, and that's sort of the PMPM PM or something similar to that. Does that is that based on practice or on practice type, or is that across the system? So we have you know we have FQHCs, independent providers, and hospital employed uh, primary care providers who have very different you know sort of pay scales. Um, and would this sort of bake those same things in, those same variants in, or would this be sort of across the board? It's it is what it is, regardless of who the provider is. That's yeah. question one. <laughs> That's yeah. a big one, I know. Okay, so let me deal with um, first of all um, shared risk arrangement on total cost of care. Individual individual providers um, need to form an integrated delivery system and share that risk. Um, and in, as you saw in our situation, it also is shared with health systems. So. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that you put um, individual providers um, at a undue risk that that potentially could push them into bankruptcy. We're not helping our health system by doing that. On the other hand, you have to have some accountability um, in terms of. And so we've kind of gone from one. Ex, we go from one extreme where the health system takes all the risk and and the providers don't feel any of that accountability. And that's not good either. So it's not it's not easy, but but coming up with hey, what's a reasonable amount of risk and accountability, but also what's the amount of, of, of reward that goes with that? In terms of primary care cap, um, a lot of the models we built are with FQHCs. FQHCs have something very unique in federal law, which says that if they move to a capitated alternative payment methodology, is that at the end of the day, is that they have to have received as much revenue as they would have under fee for service PPS. It's it's specific to them and it's specific to rural health clinics. Um, I can tell you the experience in the markets that have moved towards is that that hasn't they haven't had to pull that trigger, but that that is there. In terms of primary care providers that are not, is that the trick to this is actually is 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 being saying well what happens if it can't be a single rate there has to be a risk adjusted rate and there's not great risk adjustment methodologies you realize you know most of it is based on disease burden um, but there has to be we have to do the best we can in terms of that um, if the primary care provider is a large enough group um, there is enough patient population that like an fqhc there's enough pop, uh, primary care providers i mean excuse me primary care patients that the average risk of that population doesn't change from year to year significantly you could put that into the model if you want um, and so we're working with uh, or about to start to work um, with an ACO down in Massachusetts that wants to move their providers and they are not an FQHC to um, and so Massachusetts has has a risk stratification um, algorithm but that includes social drivers of health that is built into their district program and so we're going to be looking at how we do risk adjust um, but there is there is some risk to that again you have to set and anytime you take downside risk is you have to set a corridor um, beyond which you're saying I'm no longer going to put um, these providers at risk beyond that quarter because we don't want to push them out of business. All right, great. And then uh, my second question is, uh, I think when you're talking about committee structures, it sounded like you said that each practice had a provider uh, provider champion for that practice on the committee for the ACO. Is that is correct. that correct? We have we have a a sort of um, different representative model with our current ACO, and so we have, for example, there are two seats on the board for independent that represent independent practices, but you know we have considerably more than two independent practices across the state. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to get accurate representation. But so you're so in your model, every practice has a seat at the board. No, so every every practice has a seat on the board, but that's not what I showed you was the clinical. There's a separate clinical committee that reports up to the board. What we wanted was we didn't want each of our FQCs to have to start with a blank board and sort of saying, how am I going to deal with transition to care? How am I going to deal with frequent need utilization? How am I going to deal with the SMI population? So we want to share our experience. So what happens at that clinical is the is the provider champion is actually the one that ultimately sort of says, as a general approach, this is how we're going to deal with that issue. And then it's my responsibility to customize that and make it work in my particular practice. So they're yeah. the they're, and and because they they helped it, it's not being opposed upon them. You know what it's like, you know, is that somebody comes in and imposes a model on you and you didn't have any say in to create it, is you're gonna resist it. So this really gets their buy-in um, because they have a uh, and, and it's all based on data because those models are coming out because we're looking at our utilization and cost and quality data and making intelligent decisions based on what we're seeing. Right. No, it's it's great. It's very provider centric. It's great. All right. Th thanks so much. Sure. Thank you, Rick. Okay, Mort Wasserman. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Sorry. 
First one, uh, as, as you've already shown a lot of awareness, Vermont's a very rural state. We're either the first or the second most rural state in the right. country, depending on by the definition of proportion of the population that lives in a rural area. In Vermont, it's 60 percent. And so uh, since it seems like you have experience with both urban, your company and rural areas, I'd like to you to comment on and compare the experience in urban areas uh, or how has the rural experience been different? And what have been the special challenges in the rural areas and how have they been dealt with? Yeah, so um, the rural and even in states like Illinois, you know, basically there's a lot of rural part, a lot of FQHCs are serving rural communities. It's just that there's this concentration up in Cook County and the, and the Collar Counties. But, you know, like a good experience where I again worked on this primary care was Washington State which there is Seattle and Tacoma, but you get outside of it and it's actually very rural and probably looks a lot like Vermont, right? Um, and so and I, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, they have a, the rural areas have a harder time attracting um, primary care um, providers. Um, and so that really is a challenge. So they kind of embrace this because they view this as a way to deal with their issue of the fact that I can now make sure I'm intelligently using my primary care providers and taking a care team approach. Um, but they they certainly have that they certainly have that issue. They also have issues just in terms of just po patient um, population density. You know they don't have the same size panels that a uh, that an urban FQHC does, and there is some there is some value to scale, right? In terms of hey, I have a fixed cost and now I can spread it over a large number of patients, and so they struggle I think a bit a bit from that perspective as well. And then the other the other thing they really struggle with too is, is is in some of those areas is access to behavioral health specialists or access even to other medical specialists that they just don't have the same access that you have in an urban area. Um, so they're really forced to you have to admire a primary care doc who's out in a really rural area because he's asked he's really forced to sort of saying it's you or nothing in many situations and so. All right, thanks. My second question has to do with. Uh, people who aren't old and chronically ill. So this this experience is all like people with diabetes and hypertension and, and uh, you know, congestive heart failure. And uh, I'm a retired pediatrician. My patients were totally different. They faced, you know, the whole noise about uh, adverse childhood experiences. Well, they happen every day. And those kids are not that expensive right now. They're cheap. Right. But they're going to be very expensive in 10, 15, and 20 years. Absolutely right. So how do you build that into the model? Because 20% yeah. of our population almost, and a great majority of the Medicaid population, are kids. Right. Thanks. And we're, we, also, we often don't screen for those ACEs, right? Because we say, well, if we find out, what are we going to do with it, right? Because we don't have capacity. So are we going to build... We're going to have to build again a collaborative care model that deals with kids that have those adverse childhood experiences and sort of say okay what is it how are we going to deal with them but it can't always be with a behavioral clinician or a, or a pediatrician right so i think building those models i think we're still waiting for for those models and you obviously have more experience than i do but you're absolutely right um is that and I think the other place, though, in terms of primary care cap, where you do see it for pediatrics is, is, is again, just the low acuity um, conditions that result in ED visits, right? And so if we can improve access to care, um, because a lot of it can still be dealt with by a nurse or by a, by a quick transfer to a telehealth visit, um, with, with save, be more convenient for patients. And some of that is, is they start to learn too, right? And pretty soon they start to learn like, hey, you know, what? I can do more to self-manage instead of what, what happens when you go to the emergency room is they is they don't tell you, well, you shouldn't have been here, right? They 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 treat you and they tell you if you don't get better, come back. And then we wonder why patients come back. You know, we just taught them to come back for things that they never need to be there in the first place. So it's it's and then we blame the patient. Thanks. Thank you, Mort. Uh, Richard Slusky. Hi, Dr. Jones. Um, Richard Slesky, I'm a former hospital CEO and also worked with the Green Mountain Care Board on the development of the all-payer model. Um, so my question, uh, I may have missed the point, but my question to you is in, in the current organization you're with, is this an all-payer model or is it strictly a Medicaid MCO at this point? Yeah, I wish, so we we started our own Medicare Advantage plan. Talk about bad timing. We started just before the pandemic, January of 2020. 
Um, yeah. We are we are we are going to move into the direct um, contracting model for our Medicare patients. Okay. Um, but when I back at the at the FQC I was at, we were taking the same kind of risk as we did it for commercial Medicare and Medicaid. So that's right. But in your practice, you did all payers. Yeah, yeah, so which my, really makes a difference. Yeah. Right. And my so my question in Vermont, as you know, it's an all payer model. Exactly. Um, and one of the things I think I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the hospitals participating in your network. And in a shared savings, you're still embedded in fee-for-service mostly. And uh, so I'm wondering um, if you've thought about moving the hospitals to global budgets based on their past revenues yeah. and how, how you think that might work. Yeah, I did a little bit of work for HMA in Maryland, and so I have some familiarity with, with their right. experience. Um, I think in a rural area um, like um, like Vermont, that 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 works. It probably doesn't work that well um, in in Chicago, where there's so much transfer of people back and forth. I think one thing we're looking at in the hospitals to start to bed within our shared savings is using some episodes um, for certain procedures and getting them focused on how okay, how can I do be more efficient in managing you know this particular you know, knee replacements or hip replacements or whatever. So we are looking at that. Um, but again, for the hospital system to engage them is that they have significant, you know, they've employed a primary care practice. Um, and so getting them, getting them um, involved with that is, and then is, is a way to kind of engage them as well. But it's, it's a shared risk arrangement where they have some, some skin in the game if we, if they don't do well as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Dale Hackett, I see your hand is raised again. Yes, he's so good. I really want to ask him this question because I have a feeling that he will have an answer. Um, so when it comes to pediatrics, like I was an expensive child. I was born, there was a stroke on my occipital lobe, and so I was born legally blind. I have vision. I was just, my field of vision, I'm legally blind. What would happen is I would end up in the hospital or at the hospital, there would be running tests because this was happening, that was happening. You know, I'm a child. All I know is I don't feel good. And my next door neighbor was my um, low vision specialist. And I would be talking with him while I was working in the garden and he would say, come on in, let's check your vision. And I was like, that don't make sense to me. But what I learned is he would fix my vision and those symptoms would go away. All things are connected. Do you find that, what I'm trying to get at, I think is really important. How often do you see patients come in and with this model, can you better manage where you know the symptom is really something else like in my case it was vision because you can treat the symptoms all you want you're, you're missing the diagnosis you know missing the actual treatment that will make a difference yeah um yeah. Ho hopefully you understand that yeah so a good example of that really is behavioral health comorbidity so you'll see that patients you'll see patients that are coming in repeatedly for chest pain and and they're really having panic attacks and they've now had their chest pain worked up and they don't have coronary disease and you try and you try. And so as a primary care provider, you get you often get frustrated because they keep going back to the emergency room. And if they go to and they, if this one emergency room figures out that you don't really have, they'll go to a different emergency room. Um, so until we deal with the underlying issue for them, which is not so much their chest pain, but their panic attacks, um, and stop blaming the patient, they're gonna to continue to access the system. Um, and so I think there's a big over, overlay of behavioral health that we don't do a very good job as primary care providers or an adequate job in terms of detecting what really the underlying issue is. So I don't know if that gets to your question. I'm not sure that, I mean, that's just good practice of, of medicine. Um, and I'm not sure that this is, that this is um, Better under a model to the extent, but to the extent that an FQHC has behavioral health there, that when I'm seeing that patient and I'm sort of sensing that they have a panic attack, that I can open the door and do a warm handoff. 
to that behavioral clinician who can at least meet the patient versus what we do. What otherwise happens is, well, I'll give you an appointment with a behavioral clinician and we know the show rate is really low. So to the extent that you, again, to that earlier question about a one, one stop shop, um, you can, whether it's a care manager, whether it's a behavioral health, is that you can meet that meet that person and start to build a relationship, they're much more likely to come back um, and, and that you really need that behavioral health clinician to help us really get to the underlying cause of what's causing those panic attacks and helping to deal with them. Okay, is there any other public comment? I see no hands raised. So at this time, I'm going to thank um, you very much, um, Art and Caitlin. It was a fascinating conversation. And I think we learned a lot, and uh, it's fascinating to see the passion that you have for your work, Dr. Jones. So, well, thanks. Well, we, we certainly admire the work that's going on in Vermont, and we know it's not easy. It's easy just to stay with the old system, and you guys have, have bucked the old system and really tried to be innovative. And so, we certainly admire from a distance the work you're doing as well. Thank you so much. Okay, okay at this point in the agenda, we're going to move towards a discussion of the um, guidance for um, executive compensation at accountable care organizations. And I'm going to turn it back over to Russ McCracken. Russ. Great. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I'm here uh, at this point to present some proposed interpretive guidance uh, regarding executive compensation structure under the ACO oversight rule. The draft of the guidance, and I have some slides. I um should be presenting those um the draft of the guidance itself was circulated to the board and posted on the website and also um provided to uh one care vermont and the hca uh, in advance of this meeting as uh, just a bit of background um as part of the the fiscal year 21 budget oversight and certification process for one care. Uh, the board asked legal um, in both the budget order and the certification memo um, to explore some different options for ACO executive compensation structure and putting some additional requirements uh, around that. Uh, one, one of the options that was looked at was a broader revision of rule five, the ACO oversight rule um, to add in additional requirements regard, regarding executive compensation structure. Um, that broader revision is um, delayed or, or postponed to a bit of a later date, um, largely out of concern or the thought that there may be some additional changes um, forthcoming to the ACO um, oversight rule uh, potentially to address the regulation of Medicare only, only ACOs, uh, the direct contracting entities, or ACOs with a limited footprint in Vermont, um, some uncertainty around the future of the all-payer model, and a, a general concern that we didn't want to go through a rulemaking process um, and complete an, a rulemaking process with interim changes only to turn around and immediately start a new rulemaking process for the changes to the same rule. Uh, so with, with that in mind, we're proposing interpretive guidance regarding the requirements for executive compensation um, under and within the scope of the existing uh, Rule 5. Uh, so under Rule 5, 203A, uh, the rule requires that an ACO must have a leadership and management structure that aligns with and supports the ACO's efforts to improve quality of care, improve population health, and reduce the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures. And the guidance that we've proposed says that to comply with that section 5203A of the rule, an ACO must structure its executive compensation to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. And um, as a, we kind of lay out in the guidance, as we lay out in the guidance document, the executive compensation is a necessary part of the ACO uh, leadership and management structure. 
And this guidance is um, consistent with and advances uh, healthcare reform principles in 18 BSA 9371, um, specifically principles that the healthcare system must be transparent in design, efficient in operation, and accountable to the people it serves, and that Vermont's healthcare system must include mechanisms for containing all system costs and eliminating unnecessary expenditures, uh, including by reducing administrative costs and reducing costs that do not contribute to efficient, high quality health services or improve health outcomes. Um, the guidance that we've proposed uh, would be, is an interpretation of how ACOs comply with 5203A, um, which is a certification requirement. So in the annual eligibility verification submitted by an ACO, um, the ACO would uh, explain how um, their executive compensation structure complies with 5203A as, as we've um, interpreted it uh, in this guidance. Um, and I will um, pause there and um, open open up for uh, questions or or comments or concerns. Are there questions from the board? I had I had one question when I was reading this is to. Uh, you know, what is the consequence if the you know, annual eligibility verification doesn't verify the ACO meets the requirements of Section 5203A? Um, Yeah, um, complying with or continuing to comply with 5203A is a requirement for continued annual um, certification of an ACO. And so if there, if an ACO is not able to comply with it or, or doesn't establish um, why they would comply with it, it um, yeah, it becomes an issue with with their continued um, uh, certification. This is Robin. I just wanted to jump in. I I haven't looked at the rule all that recently, but the rule does outline sort of enforcement provisions um, of various sorts. So I think, like any other part of the certification, there are there's we as a board could determine the appropriate uh, enforcement mechanism. Thanks. Yeah, this is Mike. Go ahead, Harvard. Mike. Just just to chime in, um, too. Yeah, there is. There's a section on um, the board's ability to take action on certifications, so to limit, suspend, or revoke certification uh, of an ACO, um, which requires you know advance written notice and an opportunity for a hearing. Um, but I think the primary corrective tool the board has is to to require a corrective action plan. So, if the board felt that um, you know an ACO was not complying with this, uh, there could be a a corrective action plan that the ACO would submit to come into compliance over a certain period of time. And, and um, so, that. <clears throat> okay. Other questions or comments from the board? Is there any type of action required for interpretive guidance? Um, to approve the interpretive guidance? Yes. Um, only that the board, um, uh, only that the board uh, vote to approve it. It doesn't go through a, a separate rulemaking process. Okay, so it's a simple vote one time by the board. Yes. And you're looking for that today? 
I, I have some proposed uh, motion language here if the board's um, prepared to, to do that today. Maybe you should just show that uh, language before we open it up to public comment so people will have access to uh, all of today's information. Can okay. I ask a quick question? Um, Go ahead, Robin. Was it noticed for a vote today? That's a good question. I didn't I didn't notice it being noticed in the agenda, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't noticed in the press release. So I'm not sure if maybe Abigail knows or. Abigail, yeah. do you know the answer to that question? It was not noticed in the press release or the agenda today. So I think that probably the best thing to do would be to uh, uh, postpone the vote until next week, unless there's some type of urgency that I, I'm not aware of. Uh, there's not. OK. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment, and I see that Walter Carpenter has his hand raised. Hey, Kevin, thanks. I'm just curious, who sets the ACO CEO salaries? That would be their board of managers. Because you've got a $19 million payroll for the ACO, so I'm just curious who sets all that. Does the board approve it or do they or do you have even have a say in it? The the board um, has oversight over their budget, if you mean by this board, but it's the board yeah, of managers who make the internal decisions. All right. Are the, is there other public comment or questions? Hearing none, we'll we'll come back to this uh, discussion next week. And um, if Abigail, if you could open up uh, a period of uh, public comment on the website on this, that would be great. Absolutely. And let's have that public comment in by uh, Monday so that we will have time to uh, review any. We'll always accept it past that, but it is just would be good if the board had time to review it. OK, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Jessica to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed sig signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.